out about now. Hello, Doug. Hi, Carl. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> it's great to see you. Um, now, you came to us from Saskatchewan Indeed originally. I um, I've heard that there are many similarities between the people of Saskatchewan. I don't know how you, do you say Saskatchewaners or? Saskatchewanians or, Saskatchewan. or people from Saskatchewan would right. do. Well, I've heard there, there are similarities between yeah. people of Saskatchewan and Newfoundlanders in that I guess we're a rural culture primarily. Uh, we probably have similar views on the Confederation. Well, what is your take on that? Well, my take on it is similar. Um, when we moved here, we were, t we were taken, uh, uh, we moved out here, uh, we got married on the 17th of August and got in the car on the 20th and started driving out here for <laughs> my first university job. But the take was very similar in that farmers and fisher people, uh, they seem to have, they have to pit their wits against the weather and government and God, ne not necessarily in that order, but it's always something coming up that they have to do. So there is a, they're, they're similar that way. And also, we found at home, and more, more so here because we were strangers when we came here, people here are tremendously friendly. They want to make you feel at home. They're a little bit cautious at first uh, because they don't want really to hear about how great things were in Tirana or somewhere else. But if they think that you're going to invest in you here, then they're your pal. And it's the same thing as at home. It's very, it's very what am I saying at home? I've lived here 40 years. <laughs> the same thing out in Saskatchewan. Uh, and so the people are a lot, they're, they're true blue and they're once a friend is a friend for life. Yeah. Tell me, what part of Saskatchewan did you come from? Where, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Regina. Uh, and uh, basically born and, born and bred in Regina uh, so that we were, we were connected with farms a lot because my parents had a lot of uh, friends who were farmers and all that sort of stuff. But I was born in Regina uh, and centered around there because of the fact that Regina, is, uh, that Regina is part of Saskatchewan and Saskatchewan again is like Newfoundland. There are sort of two major centers. Uh, Regina, Saskatoon, and, and in some ways, oh, I'm getting myself in trouble here if I say the two major centers are St. John's and Corner Brook, but <laughs> the two population centers that, that people yeah. sort of rotate around. Right. And so we did spend some time in Saskatoon, never living there, but if there was going to be something musical that was going to happen often, it would happen in one place and then re, you know, re-happen in the other. Tell me about your family. Tell me about your siblings and your parents. Well, my mom and dad, uh, Dad was born in Bigger, Saskatchewan. They have this town, outside, this sign outside that says, uh, you know, New York is big, but this is bigger. That's with an <laughs> AR, of course. Uh, and he, he was a farm boy growing up. My mom was born in Scotland, uh, and her father was uh, killed in sniper fire in World War I. And if that wasn't enough, uh, her, her young brother, who was just an infant, died of the influenza epidemic, at which point her mom said, I'm done with this. I'm going out to my relatives in Canada. So off they went. Mm -hmm. And she ended up, I think they went to Winnipeg and ended up, uh, and mom and dad met in a small town just north of Regina and uh, grew up, you know, grew to love each other, of course, get married. But when they first started out, there was jobs were very slim, and so they were hired hands. They would work at farms as a couple, doing whatever they would from place to place. Spent several years doing that, made some very close friends doing that, and then my father had an opportunity to take over a trucking business, and so he, he uh, got involved in hauling uh, uh, landscaping stuff back into Regina from all over, uh, topsoil manure and building up things, and actually, he was very, very actively involved when Regina built up Wascana Center, which is a gorgeous place around the, the legislative buildings, they required a huge amount of, of, of lawns and garden materials. And Dad spent, I can recall, five or six years when practically every trucker in the area was bringing things in to, to beautify. So that's what he was involved in trucking. And Mom ran the, the phone and business part of the association of things. And of course, Mom was involved in all kinds of other things too, and uh, she was the social of the two. Father was more of doing the doing the work thing, but mom was involved as a oh, an explorer leader and all kinds of things. My siblings, 
there was one, one boy, Glenn, who died in his infancy. Uh, but then my brother Barry was my oldest, around 10 years older than I, who uh, made a career eventually in ABC News uh, and was in Paris, uh, bureau chief in Paris for a while, and Rome for seven years, and a little while in London, and eventually ended up in London. In, uh, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah, I, I, I remember Barry Dunsmore very well, yeah. uh, reporting for ABC Television News. Yeah, he um, was uh, very involved in that. He actually came back to Canada for a little while and was involved uh, in a, a, I want to say marketplace, but it was one of the shows that was investigating what goes on. It, it might not have been called that then, but then he was quickly hired, rehired back into uh, and worked for ABC. So he spent most of his working life with that. My middle brother, Lorne, uh, was uh, is uh, trained as a psychologist, and first of all, first of all, graduated high school and did some other work, and suddenly realized that he really should have gone to school. Mm -hmm. So he went and he, he trained in psychology and became hugely involved in uh, helping all kinds of people in Saskatchewan, especially in devising programs. He ran a couple of major health programs uh, for the government at the time in Saskatchewan. He became a civil servant. And he was actually one of the people who, uh, he was in the think tank that invi invented the first um, farm helpline, hemp, farm helpline in Saskatchewan uh, in the late 80s or early 90s, which was a huge boon uh, to helping people in those times. So he's been uh, retired now from that, but uh, still can't help himself by helping others and doing those sorts of things. So who else in your family had an interest in music besides uh, yourself? Mom, especially. Mm -hmm. Mom played the organ. Uh, she played piano, but she then played the organ in a little, uh, a little church uh, just about 20 miles away. In, uh, I think it was sort of in the, in the borough of Tregarva, I believe is where it was. And she played organ there, and then she played organ in another couple of little churches around in the area where she was growing up because her mom had moved in with the Campbell clan uh, who had a, a, a farm not very far from, from uh, home, but also really good friends of, of hers and dad's before they were married and after also lived in that area. So when when we came along years later, we used to go out and spend a lot of time visiting those folks. And we're pseudo farm kids, but not really. We we're still city slickers as far, as far as that went. How were your school years? My school years were really uh, interesting. Uh, we were living in a place, it was post war. And so there were, I guess, kids my age were everywhere, apparently. Uh, I started off at a school called Kitchener School. So, so this is the 50s? This is the 50s, yeah. This, so yeah. I would have been in, this would have been mid-50s, I would have been going first grade school, kindergarten grade one. Mm. Uh, and went to a place called Kitchener School, and I, did, I, I was always, I couldn't help myself, I was always singing, uh, and uh, it, encouraged, of course, by mom. But um, I sang in an amateur night, and one of the teachers said, you ought to have that recorded. And I said, okay, I <laughs> didn't know. <laughs> and so he made a recording of me singing, my new shoes shine like everything and squeak, squeak, squeak when, they, when I walk. And the <laughs> other one was, if I can help somebody. And we actually, he made a, a recording of it. We Ed Ames made a big hit out of that one. No kidding. Yeah. Wow, exactly. Yeah. Well, we couldn't play it at home because we didn't have a, rec a record player, as it turns out. But eventually, eventually we could. Eventually, um, you, you made the decision that you were going to make a, a life in music, uh, but, but why choral music and why conducting? Well, first of all, I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to go back to your introduction of me. I really like the fact that you called me a music educator hmm. because that's what I feel I am. Conducting is part of it. Um, and I wasn't actually thinking about becoming a musician. I was very strongly heading towards the idea of maybe becoming a, a United Church minister. Mm -hmm. But in high school, uh, one, the person who was teaching at the time, John Harding, he was only at our school for a year. He was a magnificent fellow, great musician, and, and he just he was one of these people where you wanted to do things for him. Anyway, I had just been elected as uh, music's, music 
person for the, the next year, which doesn't mean a whole lot, except he thought, well, you like to sing, and, and you're going to be the music director next year. I said, well, yeah, I guess. Well, next uh, spring coming up, uh, I've got to go and play. He was a trumpeter. I've got to go and play in somewhere down in the States. And I can't be here for graduation weekend. So what I'd like you to do is conduct the graduation choir. I said, I guess I could do that. I could learn how to be there. He said, no, no, he said, I want you to form it, rehearse with it, and then conduct it. You know they're all your friends. They're all one year ahead of you. You take care of it. I said, well, I thought about it. OK. I said, well, can I have Mrs. Chisholm play? Because she was the accompanist at the time. He said, certainly, Mrs. Chisholm. Will you play? Yes, I'll play. So I spent, I don't know, I guess it was maybe four or five or six weeks meeting with these students, most of whom were my pals who were graduating a year ahead of me. And we sang. And the feeling of working and making these sounds and get the evocative response that I felt from them and that we felt from the audience, I was blown away. I thought, this is really something. This is, a person could do this. And it turns out that's what I ended up going mm -hmm. to do. So uh, where did you get your degrees? Was that in Saskatchewan as well? Uh, first, yes. Uh, they, had in, they had something that was called a Bachelor of Music, uh, a Bachelor of Education, but they were, they were changing gears while I was involved. So what I did graduate with was a Bachelor of Music Education. So more or less the 70s I spent at, in Regina, mm -hmm. uh, working at Martin Collegiate, also working on my master's degree, which I finished uh, around 75 or 6 and uh, having a lot of fun. Well, it sounds like you had plenty of experience and credentials to go then to the next level of teaching, which is university level. And uh, then in 1979, you get the appointment to Memorial. How did that come about? Well, that, it's very interesting. Come about is exactly would, is how I would describe it, because I was happy enough in working uh, with the high school things in, in Saskatchewan. And also, I had been asked to do a couple of uh, large choirs to sing for the Queen on the 75th anniversary of, of Canada's, uh, sorry, of, of Saskatchewan's entrance and all that sort of stuff, and started, started working with the Philharmonic Choir there. But the chamber choir, uh, I was the, the, the assistant conductor of the chamber choir because I was working on my master's at U of R. We came on tour to Newfoundland in 1976, oh. Oh. and we sang at the Canadian National Music Educators Convention. And the major concerts were at the Arts and Culture Center, which was a beautiful building and still is now, especially now that it's redone. And uh, we sang here, and we went on tour. I think we went as far as Grand Falls, where we were we were a choir of about 18, and we had a wonderful time. And it was fun, and we met people, and it was. And of course, Newfoundlanders make it their job to be sure that. This is the best place you've ever visited, by gosh. And <laughs> that's how we went home thinking that. Mm. Uh, and about a year and a half later, there was an advertisement in the paper saying that D.F. Cook was taking, well, they didn't say he was taking sabbatical, but I found out that's what it was, that there was a one-year choral replacement job here. And my mentor and from U of, U of R, Vern Sanders, called, and he said, you should apply for that job. I said, nah, I can't get that job. He said, send in an app. Go ahead, do it. So I did, and uh, had a couple of telephone conversations uh, with uh, with uh, Cook, and uh, he said, "Okay, you're hired." I said, "Oh, okay. Uh, I'd like to come out and see the place. What's the matter with you? You're hired. You don't have to come out and see the place." I said, "No, I I I just like to come out. Well, come out if you want." So I, I came out on the on St. John's Day weekend uh, in '79. Flew out. Well, actually, almost all the way out, and then had to take the bus from Gander because it was foggy. It was good training. And got to meet people that I'd be working with and see the library and see the place and say, this will be really fun. So I was able to go home, order music that I thought I would be able mm -hmm. to use over the year, mm -hmm. and came out here. And as, as Cook said, he said, that's a one-year job. That's it. That's all there is. I said, yeah, it's OK mm -hmm. with me. It's fine. One year is good. So we came out. And in the course of the year, we had a good year. A lot of good things happened, not the least of which was that uh, our chamber choir 
uh, finished first in the chamber choir category of a brand new, brand spanking new CBC contest called the uh, Canadian, the CBC Canadian Choral Competition, and we won first place in the chamber choir co division, which surprised the heck out of me, mm -hmm. and uh, actually had a lot to do with my later development as a conductor. But at the end of the year, we packed up our little duds and had a great, wonderful se uh, send off and. Hated to leave. It was such fun. Yeah. But drove back to Saskatchewan and went back to our old jobs. And um, about six or seven months later, I got a note from uh, Maureen Voke, actually, who said, we're going to hire a choral person here next year. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> so, uh, so I applied and uh, got out. So that's how I ended up here. Yeah. And the real reason for doing it, after coming out for a year, it wasn't that the experience was that much better in some ways, but for 10 or 12 years I had worked with high school boys. And working with university men, I could sing, I could sing, we could sing mm. anything mm. with real loud, low, sort of full, full voice stuff. Mm. And that's what really turned the corner for me, to be able to work with a more, it's like working with a, you know, a piano and going to a to a pipe organ. There's just more right. There's more possibilities. So that's what sort of brought us out here. Did you realize that uh, you, you're not the first person from Saskatchewan to make his mark uh, in the Newfoundland music scene? Well, have you actually, heard of Omar Blondell? Actually, I had not, but I looked him up when you sent it to me. Mm -hmm. Holy smoke, yeah. this person, uh, uh, <laughs> the Gerald S. Uh, songbook became yeah. his uh, Bible. That's <laughs> right. He went off. So. Yeah. But he was right. He surely you've got a bunch of these recorded. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> he was the first person yeah. to record all of these Newfoundland yeah. folk songs. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, made a tremendous contribution. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of those have music. been used in, you know, spreading mm -hmm. the word on how it works. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I just thought that was an interesting. It uh, is an interesting little, story. Little uh, tidbit that uh, you might enjoy. I did. I enjoyed reading up about it. Yeah. But I hadn't known about it before. No. Or maybe if I did, I mean, when I looked it up, then I said, "Oh, it's that guy." But yeah. I had never made the Saskatchewan yeah. connection. Yeah. I just it was this person. Yeah. yeah. Now, of course, Don Cook is legendary in he is. in Newfoundland. He is. Uh, the D. F. Cook Recital Hall. Yep. Uh, he's really responsible, I guess, for getting the music school going. Oh, largely, it absolutely. Was Don Cook's doing. Um, what, what kind of an impression did he make on you? Well, he, he's a bit of a curmudgeon, uh, but he works at that. You know, yeah. he, he works at the curmudgeon thing. He, uh, he and I became fast friends, but not without butting heads a few times because I was this young whippersnapper, and mm -hmm. he was going to be sure to tell me that there were certain things whippersnappers could do and certain things mm -hmm. that we couldn't. But the real thing about being interested about here, the position that I was able to come to the first year was a grown-up, taught choral music for 15, 20 years kind of position. All the choirs, all the classes that related to choir, all that sort of stuff, because that's what Don did. Uh, so there was festival choir, the great big choir of 250, chamber choir, all that sort of stuff. It was magic. And I knew, or I thought I knew, well, I'll never luck into this again. So this was really, really fine. But when Don, um, when Don left and came back and, and, and looked around, he sort of gleaned things. <laughs> He's very sharp about figuring out what might work and what might not. And he gleaned from other people that I had really enjoyed working with festival choir. Festival choir was the big one. And I had been doing choirs uh, at home uh, in Regina several times. I was rehired for, Saska uh, for Saskatchewan's 100th year uh, celebration. And uh, once more, it was a TV special. And uh, was and this by the 2005? George, this is the 2005 one, and and I got to to conduct a wonderful choir from go over the choir and meet them and rehearse with them beforehand and bring them all together. Met the the Queen and Prince Philip, and and I I think I sent you a picture of 
my one of my choir members at home took a picture of me mm -hmm. meeting the queen mm -hmm. on her television on, in this particular <laughs> <laughs> this particular show anyway i really liked big choir stuff it was fun and it, and there are a lot of things that I, that big choirs recommend don most assuredly was not a fan of the big choir he 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 liked chamber choir why well, he could put up with the big choir, but he'd rather not do it. And he was, you know, he was figured he saw a way to to maybe move off the uh, the the festival choir to somebody who actually likes it and not have to do it anymore. And that's more or less how it worked. And I really enjoyed working at the festival choir, and eventually got to work with the chamber choir and all that sort of and stuff. And you founded the the Philharmonic. I founded the choir. Philharmonic choir. It's very. Here's. Don and I locked horns a couple of times, but this one particular time, there was some kind of a rehearsal schedule thing. Concert was coming up, and Chamber Choir, which he conducted, was going to have a rehearsal over top of one of my rehearsals. And I went in to see him, and I said, gee, Don, I said, uh, I was just looking. Oh, you're just mad because I've scheduled something over top festival choir. I said, no, no, no. I just kind of wondering how that happened. If we, if we can, and so we kind of got our way through all that. And later that year, Peter Gardner came to me and he said, "We, we really need a choir to do big works." And and we had been asking the festival choir to sing, and they came. But because of the verboten kind of thing at at exam time. Whoosh, no singing and other things. Students have got to be students. And so at the very prime time for doing Messiah and all that sort of stuff, the festival choir was really not going to be an instrument. So, you know, as Peter said, well, let's have a choir. Let's start one. OK. So I went to see Don. And I said, look, um, I, I'm going to start this choir, but I, but I want to be sure that you're not going to be upset about me doing this. I'm not doing this to get out of festival choir. I still, I like the festival choir. Whatever makes you think that I'd be mad about that. <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> he said, fine, go ahead and do it. And so we, we did. I, I didn't do it to get his permission, but I wanted him to know that I was doing it and not, you know, trying to sneak around in the, in the bushes. And the festival choir still exists, and, uh, and the Philharmonic still exists today. So it worked out very well. But we finally had a choir that could work well outside of school times. Because at the end of April, it, you're done. You can't be involved in any other things. And the same thing at Christmas. And it really, uh, it, many of the festival choir sang in both. They sang in festival choir, and they sang in the Philharmonic. Just before uh, we end, um, there is one event that you were involved with, uh, which is no, no longer happening, no, at least not in its original form, which is understandable. That's Festival 500. Um, that must have been very satisfying for you, the work you did there, because you were bringing in choirs from literally around the world. It was, it was a dream, the kind of thing. Where could you go to be inviting choirs from all over the world top-notch choirs to come and sing and share with all of us. Uh, it was spectacular. Uh, Susan Knight and Dennis Knight sort of came up with this idea. They wanted it to be wonderfully musical experience, but it was also in the middle of the fisheries crisis, and it was supposed to be an economic engine, which it turned out to be. Uh, but all these choirs coming together, and you know, the language problem didn't matter. We all, the format that we set up meant that choirs would get together and sing together, share what they knew about each other, become friends while singing. And we learned about them, and they learned about us, and it, they were part of our history then forever. And the same with them. That is the magic about choral singing. You sing together, you become friends, and wonderful things, you know, wonderful things can happen from that. Uh, it, Festival 500 was a fantastic thing. It, now, economics moved to the point where we couldn't keep doing it, uh, but many, many uh, of, I, I suppose, hundreds, uh, not on Facebook, but hundreds and hundreds of my heart friends I met mm -hmm. 
in Festival 500 and, and exchanged ideas with. And it was always a growth experience, and we were always glad to see each other. Uh, and from Festival, of course, came uh, the, the person who was the first chair of Festival, uh, Angus Bruneau, he said, you know, we should have something that, that works after this. And he came up with a million dollars and donated it to the School of Music to come up with the, the eventually came up the, with the, uh, the Bruneau Center for Choral Excellence, which sole idea is to be making ripples in the community by making amounts of money available to local people to do things that they couldn't otherwise do if they didn't have, to have that little extra help. So it's just... And, it's, and what is your involvement with that? Because you're... I was the first chair. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I was the first chair. I was involved in the setting up of it. I was the first chair of it, and I've, I'm still a board member of it. And so basically each year, we put out advertisements to say, do you want to do something? Do you want to bring somebody in? Do you want to go and study somewhere? Now, this is not tens and tens and t well, it can be tens of thousands, but it's not, it's not a bottomless pit. But we have helped all kinds of young and not so young people sort of retool a few things and, and, and meet people who they never would have had. Some of the people who came to Festival 500 have come back and worked in our area just to, you know, keep things going. It's, it's wonderful. And that was Angus and Jean Bruneau's dream and my gosh, what, two gen more generous people you'd never meet. Choral music is alive and well in Newfoundland and Labrador. I think it is. And that's, uh, that's a good thing. Thank you very much. Thanks, so. Carl. Okay. is here for you a one-stop shop for a variety of products homestyle breads sandwiches plus check out our freshly baked artisan breads and single serve desserts exclusively at our in-store bakery on frecker drive with 25 locations wherever you go there we are call the rogers tv viewer response line email us or connect with us on social media at saint john ambulance we're all about community we teach life-saving skills and provide community support through our volunteer services. All St. John Ambulance product sales and training registrations support these important services. Volunteer, donate, or enroll in a program today so we can continue to have an impact on our community. Visit sja.ca to learn more. At St. John Ambulance, we do more than save lives, we change lives. Hi, I'm Kathy Hicks.